Our second plenary speaker is Gay Stewart of West Virginia University, who did her PhD work at Illinois and studied uh, D. Maison decays. Gay is most well known for her tremendous work with teachers and teacher preparation and creating new teachers. She ran one of the first phys tech sites at the University of Arkansas and ran their UTeach program and then did another, did another replication effort at West Virginia University when she moved there in 2014, where she leads the WVU Center for Excellence in STEM Education. Gay was the winner of the AEPT's 2019 Orsted Medal, recognizing her tremendous leadership in physics education and her mentoring of many students and in-service teachers for many years. Those of you who are teaching at the high school level, she did a colloquium on this Thursday and um, talk to all of my department about how to mentor and support future teachers in this area. Please, today she's going to talk to us about uh, sloppy physics. Please send a warm telepathic welcome to Gay Stewart. Hi, everybody. Um, and there are going to be some times, Kevin, where I ask people to throw out some ideas about something. And I guess you're going to get to report out on what you see in the questions, OK? Um, so today I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, some of the sins that that us college faculty uh, commit all the time. Um, if you want the talk later, I will send it to you. And there's a long abstract, which I'm not going to go on for right now. Uh, the idea is that energy and systems are really fundamental to understanding not just physics, but all sciences. And, but physics is the place to really help the students develop deeper conceptual understanding. Unfortunately, um, we often try to simplify our discussions to make it sound easier, not have quite so many words in it. But the students hear what we say, not what we mean. And sometimes this generates increased confusion. So today we're going to look at a couple of examples of some of the common wording that seems to generate incorrect models. Um, some problems where we've we've seen these incorrect models have surfaced and make some suggestions for changes in wording that can really help kids develop in places a single coherent conceptual model instead of thinking they have to memorize a bunch of rules for special cases. So despite Kevin's lovely introduction, you might be wondering, you know, how did I get to help identify best practices for introductory physics? Um, and um, I became a, a physics education research person in um, 1993, well, 1994, I fell for it in 93, because I went to a conference and I found out that we actually knew how to help people learn. And since that time, I became a faculty member in 94, I've spent a lot of time thinking about misconceptions and how to teach introductory physics. Um, so I basically, you know, got to do some good stuff uh, funded by the National Science Foundation at Arkansas. And then I got this call from my first program officer from NSF, Ruth Howes. And she said, what if you could get your hands on a national college curriculum? which of course we all know doesn't exist, or I thought it didn't exist. And then she explained to me that that's what AP is. So I told her I couldn't imagine them wanting me on the committee. The next day I got the invitation, so I knew she'd set me up. I had to say yes though. And once I was involved in AP, it was natural to become involved in a push to identify and implement best practices. Um, Kevin kind of mentioned this, if you don't know what we mean by good stuff. Um, I started at Arkansas in 94 and we went from graduating, you know, between zero and two physics majors a year to uh, 30 and a significant increase in the number of teachers. We were one of the first phys tech sites. That was kind of cool. Um, my first grant was actually for revising the second semester introductory course. And what we found was that if we better served all students, the department benefited. When we started phys tech, we realized that if there's a reason we thought teachers should teach a particular way, then if 
we then we should do it. And what we found is that really increased our number of majors and, uh, you know, going into all uh, career choices, not just teaching, but it's really hard to graduate eight teachers if you're only graduating two majors. So that was useful. Um, we offer absolutely no special introductory courses for physics majors or potential physics teachers. And our argument was you never know who's going to be a teacher or a physics major. Um, we uh, had some, in those reform courses, we created lots of opportunities for students to interact with peers in learning introductory physics, getting them to talk about it and reason it out, which helped them learn the material and also served as an ultra early uh, field experience. And I'm, I'm sure, you know, it's true of all the other phys tech and you teach sites, our teachers are doing an amazing job with their students. Um, so why me continued, you know, Ruth uh, asked me, uh, she was my program officer uh, and I ended up on the AP test development committee. Uh, from that, I ended up on the science academic advisory committee for the college board, which I chaired um, leading up to and through the early stages of the redesign. Um, the um, Center for Educational Policy Research was tasked with the college curriculum study, which is what we refer to as the best practice study, um, and then a physics calibration team. And the members of those teams were nominated by college board and professional organizations such as AAPT. Um, the course validation panel, they went with major stakeholders, um, AAPT, the APS Committee on Women in Physics, APS Forum on Education, National Society of Black Physicists, uh, National Society of Hispanic Physicists, NSTA, and Project Kaleidoscope, for instance. Um, and then, um, so I, I got to serve as a co-chair of the, the redesign, which was uh, people nominated by the College Board and the National Science Foundation and the National Science Foundation got to pick. And then there was a review advisory panel. And then after all that, they let me play on the curriculum development and assessment committee. And I co-chaired AP Physics II during its, its launch. So the, the idea uh, behind the redesign and in kind of casting our frame of thinking about looking for best practices, in 2002, the National Research Council published a critique of accelerated high school science programs. Uh, the reports had panels for each of the disciplines and a summary report, and there were some recommendations the subtle conclusion of the report was that AP courses should still be taken, that the major problems they found with AP were actually that they were too much like the average college course, a mile wide and an inch deep. And so the, the NSF actually funded the redesign with the hope of creating a model best practice college course that might influence what was done in higher education. Um, so the idea was that courses should emphasize deep understanding rather than comprehensive coverage. Uh, that programs should reflect the current understanding of learning in the discipline. Uh, that the courses should include strong emphasis on inquiry and reasoning. And basically the punchline here, why college faculty should care, um, you know, is these things lead to more people who want to study science, also more people who think positively about science and, you know, might vote for things that have to do with science. Um, so the idea was to create a new model for intro college physics. And so there was um, the course curriculum study uh, was uh, conducted uh, to look at best practices in existing college physics courses. Because the AP courses were going to be taught in high school, though, we also looked at national and select state standards to ensure that we didn't hurt high school AP teachers. And in addition to learning and understanding, uh, we used established learning science approaches to curriculum and 
assessment design, such as the understanding by design by Wiggins and McTeague. Um, and the idea there is first one identifies what you really want the kid to learn, and then you work backward to develop the courses. Um, the college curriculum study, just to give you an idea, you know, each, each part of this process was fairly time consuming. Um, the college board staff facilitated the work, but it was, you know, primarily run by disciplinary experts and the, the center here. Um, and then once these best practice studies were done, that became the launch point for the AP physics or the AP science redesigns. Everybody was doing it. Um, there was, uh, for the, the final phase of this, almost $2.2 million, about $3 million overall from the National Science Foundation. Uh, the principal investigators were primarily learning science people, and then the commissions were brought in to bring in the subject matter expertise. Um, consensus, again, of the professional organizations, uh, National Science Foundation, College Board. Um, how I got on there, I don't know. We were considered leaders in higher and secondary education with subject specific expertise. And we provided the input and guidance on the essential course content, inquiry reasoning skills, and the instructional practices. Um, Larry Kane was my um, co chair in leading that team of physics experts to design, to define that essential concepts. Um, so we were uh, charged to focus um, on a set of goals. Again, increasing the depth of understanding, developing capacity to use critical skills by limiting breadth of content, to draw upon current research in the theory of learning, instruction and assessment, establish coherence within and across the disciplines by organizing curriculum instruction and assessment using unifying themes, and creating learning programs accessible to students from a broad range of backgrounds. We always had to think about how would you do this in different classroom settings and make sure we weren't leaving out students. Uh, and to prepare students for success in the subsequent college level courses within the disciplines and to get them excited about t careers in those disciplines. The thing we're gonna focus on today is the the facet of increasing the depth of understanding of those essential concepts. Um, and again, my premise here is that students hear what we say. So if we leave out some of the words to make it sound easier, we end up leaving out some of the connections students need to successfully fit the pieces together in a way they can understand, use, and remember. So what I'm gonna do is walk through some examples of simplified statements. We're gonna look at the misunderstandings to which these common statements can lead. Please feel free to ask questions at any time. Um, because of this rather weird uh, situation we find ourselves in, me not there with you. Um, Kevin's gonna, he's been directed to flag me down because um, I'm not gonna try to see the questions on the screen. It's hard enough to fit everything on my little screen on my computer that's got a camera. Um, and we're gonna look at some problems together. And again, I'm really sorry this is gonna be less hands-on than I like to be when I'm with my AAPT family. Okay, so um, I'm gonna throw in a few models too. Um, and some models are so basic to us, we don't even think to define them. And let's see if you agree with me as we go forward. I am gonna use the AP language for one model um, object. If you're not familiar with AP, you might call the object model, the particle model or a point mass model. The name doesn't matter as long as you define it for your students. Um, the defining feature, it lacks spatial extension or you can ignore its spatial extension. This is appropriate for representation whenever the size, shape and structure are relevant for a given context. 
Um, we made this somewhat awkward choice uh, of the word object when we were doing AP because many examples given in physics actually do use object this way. And then later on, they use object to mean something else, and uh, which causes a lot of confusion for students. And we didn't want to use the term particle because of confusing kids about we're going to introduce them to elementary particles. There's a whole zoo in particle physics, and many of those things do have internal structure. So first simplified statement. And I would normally ask you guys to raise your hand if you'd ever seen it said this way. Um, I know certainly the first time I had physics, my instructor talked about the potential energy of the ball. And you know that leads to a misunderstanding uh, that an object by itself can have potential energy, but this isn't really true. Um, really, potential energy is the property of a system. An object cannot have potential energy on its own. And the statement really doesn't support understanding of why or when you would choose to use work or potential energy. And I must admit, this was something I was going to do a detailed research project on, but health problems got to me. So instead, I'm going to show you some results from AAAS and some anecdotal results from a couple of thousand of my students and some potential issues identified on AP exams for several hundred thousand students. And the thing here is you just know or you don't what somebody really means when they say the potential energy of the ball. Um, so potential energy is a property of a system. If we've defined our object model to be something with no extent that you can't change its shape, then it can't have potential energy. Um, and uh, potential energy makes most sense to the students when it's developed as a consistent concept. Um, when, and you know, even with little kids, you can sit them down with two magnets or a ball or a rubber band and they can feel if you squeeze it or stretch it or try to move the magnets near each other, there's, there's something there. Um, and that it changes as you move those things with respect to each other or change the shape. So potential energy always depends on configuration. If you can't change the shape, it can't have potential energy. Um, you know, gravitational potential energy is referred to in a AAAS problem we're going to look at as a property of a person hiking up a mountain. And this is related to a significant conceptual problem that students have with gravitational potential energy, believing it can be associated with a single object. And it's not actually only present when you're talking about a system that can have its shape changed in some way. Of course, the problem is that students who actually understand well uh, will often find the question not answerable or they just know what you mean. And so they, you know, because they've learned the, the special language and um, other students, it just feeds the common misunderstanding. The sneaky bit about this is, you know, a friend of mine at Harvard actually wandered around to his faculty colleagues and he asked them a problem. And a lot of them originally were putting gravitational potential energy and work due to gravity in together. And then, the thing is that you're a physicist, you automatically self-correct and you realize, oh no. Um, and I first realized that this was an issue when I got asked to do, uh, to work with some sixth grade teachers about energy. And I said, well, send, I had never worked with this grade at that time. And I said, please send me your favorite professional development material so I can kind of see where we are and what we should be doing. And their very favorite professional development material used by the school was, of course, the roller coaster. And it had the work due to gravity and the change in gravitational potential energy in the same equation. But they never noticed because they never did it mathematically. It was just qualitative. And when I brought out that these two things weren't supposed to be there at the same time, they actually had no idea why not or no idea how you would choose. Um, so, um, 
let's see. Let me show an example here. So we've got, you know, a hiker going up the mountain and they ask for these three different paths. Um, you know, what's the change in gravitational energy uh, of the, or what, which hiker will have the greatest amount of gravitational potential energy. And, you know, the AAAS, when I brought up this concern, was very happy to show me that their S curve here looks just like you'd expect for a test. Uh, the high uh, performing students mostly got it right. The shape of that curve looks just like it should. Of course, the thing is, they didn't ask a question here that allowed you to discriminate between whether or not people know. So if you're a good student that basically has the idea, you're going to say, well, the only one of these answers it can be is for whether or not that really um, makes sense to you. In Arkansas, we had a state science test where they actually asked, cannot be determined. And of course, the gravitational potential energy of the hiker is by himself is undefined, so cannot be determined is the right answer. And we saw quite a few really good students pick the cannot be determined, but it was a much smaller study, so, and nothing published. It was just me peeking at data that I didn't have IRB for. Um, so they did have another problem at AAAS where they actually looked at understanding the potential energy of a system. And what they found here was, um, while the better students still did better, there was a lot more confusion about what was going on. Um, so this was, you know, sort of 4,000 students and um, several thousand teachers. And the, um, you know, the probability of getting it correct only came anywhere near a half for the really high ability students. And the kids were, and, and teachers, whoops, sorry, I thought I had some more information there, were confused um, that they didn't understand the way the shape of a system related to gravitational potential energy. We had a lot more people choosing things that, that didn't uh, support understanding how that dependence on distance mattered. So what we found, or you know, anecdotally in my own teaching, if I start by defining a system, then which to use is always clear. Potential energy is internal to the system. It always depends on configuration. So if you can't change its shape, it can't have potential energy. If I talk about a ball, then it's not going to have gravitational potential energy unless I'm talking about a ball earth system so I can change the shape of where the ball is with respect to the earth. A ball could have elastic potential energy if I can squeeze it. Of course, then it's not actually an object because definition of object is I can't change its shape. If it's just the ball, then the earth is exerting an external force on it. So we'll use the concept of work, a transfer of energy to the system by something external to the system. And here's an example of a problem where we had uh, over 100,000 students. Um, and I feel like using AP questions is, uh, to give example of college level understanding is fair. When we do calibration studies, we find the AP students tend to do better on the questions than when we give these questions in college classes. Uh, the care of the construction of the exam, even if it could give be better, uh, is usually pretty good. And we know it's more important for students to actually understand something than just be able to manipulate equations if they're gonna be able to retain it and use the information in subsequent courses. Um, so this question um, was worth seven points. This part A was worth three points. And the student scored an average of 2.1 on the whole problem. Um, so I want you to think about how your students, not you, might approach this, this kind of question and um, share out. Let's give Kevin something to do. It's not quite voting. 
uh, type something into the, the question, what you think the students, the approach the students might have used on this problem. Do we have any comments? Come. Yes, we do. Yes. A, one attendee responds, draw a system schema and then an LOL chart for analysis. Okay. Another attendee responds, students might say team two would see it land farther away, further away because it has more time to accelerate. Okay. All right. So we actually, um, yeah, now if, if the students actually applied the, the system schema, they tended to do very well. There was a pretty wide dichotomy on this. Um, they, most of them tried to apply conservation of energy and most used that potential energy went to kinetic energy. They didn't actually, the, their big problem was understanding that was the change in potential energy instead of just potential energy. Um, so they had this memorized thing that, that they went and used and they weren't thinking that it had to do, you know, with the change in the height above, uh, above the earth. So some good, good responses. This one might be even uh, more entertaining. We had, uh, and remember, this is part of that same problem. So 2.1 points out of seven on the whole thing. The students were told the block started now at the same height, the tables are the same height and asked um, which block if either lands farther from its respective table and which block hits the floor first. Um, do you want to give me a few comments on what you think students might have done here? One comment that has come in, uh, students will be concerned with path length. Yes. Yes, the students were concerned with path length. Um, and uh, so they didn't, they absolutely didn't get the fact that the path doesn't matter for the change in energy due to a conservative force. But then they also had trouble with the idea that although the change in energy is the same in the two, block one speeds up faster. So it's going um, faster for more of the time. And so leaves the table first. Um, but yeah, so the just the lack of understanding of path independence is absolutely right. There are some other um, models that, um, so we've already talked about object and that's really important in energy work force and kinematics because every time you draw a free body diagram and you just draw it as a dot, you're saying I'm, I'm using the object model or I'm only concerned with the, the motion of the center of mass of the system. And, uh, but we rarely, remind our students that that's what we're doing. And so then they have some trouble when, you know, that's not the appropriate thing to do. Um, the, there's some other models that are important that we don't always explicitly let our students in on. We talk about frictionless all the time um, without necessarily reminding the students it's an approximation. So they then have a hard time understanding um, when they should um, not do that and what the changes are going to be. But frankly, massless is the one that gets me the most because the, the model that something is massless, and again, I would strongly recommend just saying negligible mass, it doesn't even require it to be light, right? 
I can just that the force of gravity exerted on it is less than other forces. So for instance, if I'm talking about a really heavy chain and a boat pulling away from a dock, then that heavy chain can be approximated as a negligible mass. Um, I could have another case where even a string couldn't be approximated as negligible because the thing I have hanging on it is also very, very small. So um, negligible mass, really getting kids to think about if they can neglect it when they're using that model. All right, and Kevin will let me know if there's a question or a raspberry or anything. Um, okay, next simplified statement. Work equals force times distance. This is actually really confusing for students. Um, you know, what distance is this? Is it clear it has to be an external force? So, you know, the statement does not support an understanding of the, the real definition of work, which is something external to the system changing the energy of a system. Um, you know, you can push on a table. This, I'm sure we all do this example. You jump up and down, pushing on the table. You show that you got all tired, but if the table doesn't move or flex, you haven't done any work on it, no matter how hard I pushed or how tired I get. I don't change the table's energy. If I lean against the wall, the same thing. I can lean against the wall all day. It's exerting a force on me, but that force doesn't add to my energy. When I push off from the wall, did it do anything different? No, I converted my own internal energy to kinetic energy. The wall didn't add any energy to the system of me. And so, you know, this is another one of those cases where yeah, you either know what you mean by the statement or you don't. Um, so again, the problems I brought up, what distance is it clear it has to be an external force? Since work is the transfer of energy into or out of a system by something external to that system, uh, we describe an interaction with something outside of the system as an external force. So it has to be an external force. And how far the point on the system in which the force is exerted moves in the direction of the force is the actual distance. We often kind of, you know, gloss over that because we're using an object model. So how far the point you push on the system moves the same as how far the center of mass moves. How far the center of mass of the system moves in the direction of the force is the magnitude, gives you the, the change in the kinetic energy if the center of mass of the system and the point of application of the force move different distances, that's when you really have the work, the full work energy theorem and you can have things other than kinetic energy. So we often show the kids the work kinetic energy and then they, we show them the work energy theorem and they don't understand where that difference comes from. Okay, because again, if we're using an object model or we're talking about the center mass of the system, right? Every point moves the same distance in the same direction. So the only thing we can change um, for that object by pushing on it is its kinetic energy. Okay, this one is the one that's hardest for me to break myself of because we've said it this way so long and I got pulled aside by um, a big, um, organization does research on middle and high school science learning and they said the most prominent thing they saw is a misconception by students grades 7 through 12 was that forces were independent actors things by themselves um, so using this this word act instead of always reminding them that a force is exerted on one thing by another thing uh, can help lead to this. And it was really funny because about a year after I got pulled aside in DC and warned about this, there was a high stakes seventh grade science test in Arkansas that one of my uh, high school colleagues had been asked to look at and he sent it by. And um, the misconception that the force existed all by itself as an independent entity 
It actually even keyed as the right answer. The only way you could get that answer is if you had that misconception. Um, and this was really the point of the learning and understanding report. If you don't understand something, it doesn't stay with you or work in new situations. And, you know, I anecdotally, I think this is a reason that the transfer physics concepts is often so bad. Um, we had a, um, we gave a force concept inventory to middle school teachers. Uh, now in Arkansas, Newton's laws are taught in middle school and some of them scored two points on this inventory, which had 35 items, each of which had five choices. So random guessing, you would expect seven. So what it showed was it wasn't just they didn't know, they actually had a very wrong model of how forces act. Um, it causes confusion, not just in, in thinking about forces, but when thinking about work, if you think force is a thing, then where does the energy come from? Okay, so um, so saying a you know a simple statement does not support understanding of the profound definition of work. Something that can add energy. If something does work on a system, it must provide energy to the system. And here was something that I had a long conversation with many uh, colleagues about. Where does the energy come from when a rubber ball bounces off the wall? Um, and I had people wanting to say that the wall did work on the ball. But if you think about it, when the ball hits the wall, unless the wall flexes, the point of contact does not move. So the ball squeezes as it approaches the wall, right? It is no longer acting like an object. It's using its internal energy or converting its internal energy. Um, that initial kinetic energy is now becoming elastic potential energy if the ball is elastic. Then the ball allows the wall to convert that internal energy back into kinetic energy by being there as the center of mass of the ball is moving. Um, if the ball didn't flex, nothing would happen. Um, the difference between the ball hitting the wall and bouncing off and the lump of dough hitting the wall and not bouncing off has nothing to do with the wall. It has to do with the ability of the thing hitting the wall to turn that kinetic energy into internal energy. What kind of internal energy? and whether it comes back. That's also the same thing we see when we do uh, collisions in conservation of momentum. At the instant those two things come at rest, come to rest with respect to each other, they all look exactly the same um, motion-wise, but the difference is whether that energy has been stored into a form that can come back into kinetic energy or not. Um, a question I just saw on a, a physics teacher listserv recently had to do around do with the, the types of friction and understanding where energy comes from when you run, right? And so the point of contact of the force doesn't move. If you're doing the most effective motion possible, your foot is at rest with respect to the ground and you're pushing on the ground. So the ground's pushing forward on you, but you could stand on the ground all day and you'd never go forward. You have to be in converting your internal energy to move you forward. Um, you know, and the friction is, is, is just weird. Um, it's a way we describe an interaction between surfaces, but it can only move energy around if something else is causing the relative motion. So I kind of think of it as fake work. Um, but you can imagine trying to stand still on a treadmill. The belt is moving, the motor's driving the belt and providing the energy, and the belt's doing the work on you until you fall off in the end, but that energy is coming from the, the motor. The, the friction force itself cannot, um, cannot uh, provide 
energy. And okay, so the same thing when I drop the, the ball of dough and it hits the ground, right? It has kinetic energy, it goes splat. So we've turned the kinetic energy it had into a change in internal energy. And if it goes splat instead of bounce, that was, uh, you know, a, a non-reversible change in shape. So we've lost that energy to usable mechanical energy. So a lot of students believe a force is a thing that exists by itself. I said that, an independent actor. And so again, using some careful language can help us replace this flawed model. A force is a way to describe the interaction between objects or systems, right? It is not a thing in and of itself. It is a way to describe an interaction. It's always exerted by one object or system on another. And I always stress with the students, they should identify both those things. If both the thing that I'm thinking of as exerting and feeling the force are in the same system and the interaction is a conservative one, then instead of using forces, I could talk about potential energy. If the interaction isn't conservative, I can still discuss changes in types of energy, but not work if they're both in the system. Okay, so when thinking about work, if the force is misidentified as a thing, students get really confused about where energy comes from, which is one way that they can use to check their problems and make sure that they're thinking about the problem in the right way. Does it make sense? So many students don't think physics makes sense because they don't understand kind of the rules because we've simplified it. And so they have a bunch of models or a bunch of little things they've memorized instead of one model of tracking the energy through. Um, and I'm gonna show you another example of students understanding which interaction caused what sort of change of energy going to pull out another uh, problem here. So they're given a, um, a wooden wheel rolling down a ramp. And they're asked to, yeah, and I know it says act. We've, we've fussed at the, the people who wrote this test about that. It's not, supposedly not going to happen again. Um, so the ramp exerts a static friction force on the wheel. The wheel rolls without slipping. And I wanna think again, think through how your students, not you would approach the problem um, or maybe not your students, but a student that hadn't had the advantage of having you. How do you think they draw the free body diagram and what will they say is the system and what happens to the energy? And we'll put Kevin back to work. See the whole staring at you until you answer doesn't work in this situation because I cannot see your eyeballs. Do we have any comments, Kevin? None yet. Here's our first response. I think they will treat the wheel like a point particle with all of the mass of the center. Absolutely. So again, over 100,000 students, the average was less than two points out of seven. They drew all the forces at the center of mass. They treated the wheel like an object, which is a problem since an object can't rotate. Um, Here's they another did, comment. Oh, okay, great. Says they would draw the free body diagram from the center of the wheel, which makes it difficult to apply the force of static friction. Absolutely. Um, they didn't understand that the static friction only allowed the wheel to rotate. Um, you know that it couldn't do work because the point of application of that force was not moving if they drew friction at the right place. And so they ended up saying that 
you know, it had less energy at the bottom of the incline instead of that the energy was instead partially, you know, the center of mass motion and partially the rotational motion. Um, and really just, you know, without, they did a lot of center of mass stuff. They treat it like a particle. They didn't put the, um, you know, the forces where they belonged. And so they missed major components about what was going on and understanding how energy could move in or out of the system. Okay, here's another one that also drives me crazy. Um, Cause we see this all the time and it, actually it's okay to write this, but we need to put down something more because this leads our students to the misunderstanding that both of these things are going on at the same time. Um, and even if we convince them to only use one, again, they wonder how can you tell which of these to use? And again, this is one of those cases of you either know or you don't. So I, um, I like to use little bubbles, um, but you know, on a blackboard, it might be easier just to have them in columns and label the columns. Something to make it really clear that when you set these things equal, it's not that they're happening at the same time. It is that one of them represents one definition of the system and the other one represents what happens with the other definition of the system. And even if we say that as we're writing it on the board, sometimes the kids just write down what we wrote down and you know what they see later is just what was written down. Um, and you know, if, if an interaction only depends on the configuration of a system, so if we add those extra words in and say the earth ball system, um, then that ha can have a configuration and you can talk about a conservative interaction. Um, you can call it an internal force instead of an interaction. I let people do that. I tend to use the configuration language a lot um, to drive home the idea and the interaction language that we only use forces and work for external interactions. Um, this was, again, that, that sixth grade professional development activity was actually what got me started into this area of trying to understand how people learn physics. Um, and again, they, you know, their favorite professional development was supporting a misconception that they never caught because they were only doing it qualitatively. But once we started talking about defining a system and if it's internal, you talk about conservation or potential energy, if it's external, you talk about work. They say, oh, that makes sense. So, um, you know, it's a few extra words, but it seemed well worth it for the, the change in understanding. And then we can talk about work as the mechanical energy or mechanical transfer of energy to an object or system by another object or system that's external to it. And the potential energy is the internal energy of a system. Uh, do the interactions inside the, the system that only depend on configuration. And once we've, um, once we've laid those things out, what force, what distance, what is that distance in potential energy all um, start to make more sense. And we saw in that initial launch speed problem that kids had difficulty understanding, you know, they MGH, you know, they didn't know which H was important. Um, so, and there was an, another pro, and they really got confused, you know, use delta U or U. They didn't clearly connect how delta U and the height change were related although this is the thing we tend to think they understand the best. There was another problem a couple of years later in AP um, where the, the students were asked to design a lab to measure a spring constant of a spring inside a launcher. And um, many tried to use forces and didn't really reason about them as they might have if they really understood work. 
um, it was it was kind of painful to see the the disconnect between understanding. Um, you know, they they thought that the the force needed to stop the ball that has been launched was the same as the force the spring doing the work on the ball to launch it had exerted, even though those were over uh, different distances. And um, yeah, and it's almost every student who started out carefully defining their system did way better. Um, than the students who uh, did not start out trying to think about systems and just jump straight to, um, they stuck a force plate in front of the thing and, and tried to do it that way. Okay, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna get into some heresy. People say that energy is conserved in an elastic collision a lot. And in this case, it actually is true, but it's always conserved. That's one of the foundations of our understanding of the universe. Energy is constant in a closed or well, in an isolated system. I tend to put both those words together because some people when they're thinking about thermo or mechanics or God help us when I have chemists in the audience, they um, we all like to use different words, but an isolated system, um, something that the energy can't move into or out of. And uh, so there's my explaining my rant there. And you know, it's really important if it looks like you lost some energy, then you know there was a transfer of energy out of the system and it wasn't isolated. Um, or that that energy got changed into a type that we have a harder time measuring. But it's not that energy is not conserved in any collision. It's that it's constant in an elastic collision. Another one we like to say is that kinetic energy is conserved in elastic collision. And of course, that's not even true. Mechanical energy is conserved. Kinetic energy is restored. In any elastic collision, there's an instant where the relative velocity uh, is zero. And it's how much of the initial kinetic energy is stored in other form of mechanical energy at that time that determines how elastic the collision is. So, um, you know, mechanical energy is conserved, kinetic energy is restored. Again, the kinetic energy changes during the collision. And, um, you know, collision is another model we use all the time. What do we mean? It's just an interaction that takes place over a short amount of time where the internal interactions are much larger than the participants are experiencing due to any other thing at that time. So two cars colliding, even though there's friction with the road, I can, I can use a collision model to calculate a lot of things about that because during the collision, that interaction between the cars is so much bigger than the friction. And again, during a collision, there's always an instant when the participants come to rest with respect to each other in any type of collision. And how much of the relative velocity gets restored determines that type of collision. So kids wander off with thinking energy is only conserved in certain cases and they get, and that kinetic energy is conserved in other cases. And they, get, they have a hard time then consistently using those energy models um, especially when you give them a situation where they have to think about how energy moves from one thing to another. Um, so in this question, they, you start out with a block on a spring, you can press the spring. And um, then as it moves from the uncompressed spring, um, it travels along a surface, uh, at some point it hits a part of the surface that has friction and um, they're asked, you know, to do uh, some things. And even those that had the right equations had trouble using the words. So it was hard to tell if they actually understood or were just good with equations. Um, since some of them actually used the wrong distances, it made it seem unlikely that they, you know, even if they had the right equations written down, if they 
stuck the wrong um, distances in those equations. It made it seem unlikely that they really understood the equations. And you know, the average score was less than three out of 12. The students were asked to graph the kinetic energy of the block and the potential energy of the block spring system as a function location for the motion. And then they were asked to repeat and compare when the block was pulled back twice as far uh, to start, including how far it would go. And um, really, really ugly things happened there. So, I guess I want to hope you guys are going to have some questions. I've only got a few minutes left. I want to really thank. Uh, the Physics Teacher Education Coalition, which has uh, been supporting and then encouraging uh, my husband and my adventure for about 20 years on helping produce some awesome physics teachers. And um, if you're looking for help recruiting new teacher candidates, please visit getthefactsout.org. And the American Physical Society and the American Association of Physics Teachers are launching a new uh, program, uh, a set of resources for improving undergraduate physics programs. And if you Google EP3, you'll find that. Or if you ask me for these slides, they have links. And thank you very much. Questions, please. Okay, a question that's come in is how can we get a copy of this session? Uh, I believe we will be. Uh, Barring any technical problems, if we get permission from all the speakers, we'll, we will be posting copies of these Zoom sessions. Okay. And could you throw my uh, email in the Q&A? Because if anybody wants, just email me and I'll send you the, the slides. And yes, there are 11 more slides I didn't show. Um, and the slides have all my notes in them. Of course, then Kevin has to, well, no, if you, you just email me if he gives you my email. Here's another question. As I am preparing a lesson, is there a list of statements, concepts I should avoid? Um, there, I don't know of a place that like just gives the, um, like a, a concise list. Um, I did the thing I, I swore I was never going to do uh, because high school teachers told me, well, you're a college faculty member. You can get away with telling the kids the book is wrong. So um, a bunch of excellent high school physics teachers and I got together and, and made a book which has a lot of it in it. And if you email me, I can get you a free copy. Um, Is it something I had never considered as a faculty member? I have the luxury of telling the kids, yeah, you know, the way this guy said this, I don't agree with this. And, you know, I have as much credentials as the person who wrote the book. And so the kids will listen to me. But they, my high school uh, teacher graduates just said that was not, it's not the same feeling in a class when, as a high school teacher um, in that one particular respect. Another question, what is your opinion on the AMTA, American Modeling Teacher Association curriculum? There's a lot of good stuff in there. Um, there are some places where you can, um, if you're really comfortable and know how to use all the words right, then you can guide the kids much more effectively to solid models. Um, a teacher that's got a little less um, background and confidence, the kids can actually walk out with some some confusion. Um, you know, and I don't think that's the the curricula's fault. It's just you know it has to be used carefully, and I speak from experience. Um, <laughs> okay. Have you done any work with making a book on CK twelve? which would make it free and available to anyone? Um, I did not do that. And the, the reason being in order to ask high school teachers to help me produce materials, I 
wanted to be able to have them be paid. I didn't care if I got any money, but I definitely did not want to ask high school teachers to invest significant amounts of time. And that's what, you know, doing a textbook through a publisher allowed us to do. So I'm allowed to give away, you know, my textbook all I want. I'm not allowed to give away the teacher's edition. And Note that I put your contact information in that last response. Thank you. Thank you. One last question. For the issues you described with forces, mm -hmm. do you think um, a valid approach would be to start with Newton's third law and use that to, in to introduce the idea of the force as an interaction between two things and let that be the first law you start with? Yeah. So when, when I taught the calculus-based class, I used uh, a book by Eric Mazur, which does uh, momentum first. And then we went into um, Newton's third law and then, um, and then Newton's laws. I think you can, um, you can start anywhere you want to in Newton's laws, but it's, it's just really important to help them understand that you're, you're talking about the way things interact and this is a mathematical model for that. And then Newton's law, Newton's third law makes a lot of sense and the kids tend to do very well with it if they come to whatever path they go through Newton's laws, if they come to it with the idea that it's always describing an interaction. I don't know if that made any sense, I hope so. Well, thank you very much for your uh, time and energy today. We've certainly enjoyed this very much. Thank and you. For your time and energy on Thursday as, as, as well. Okay, and if anybody thinks up a question later, feel free to email me. Um, you know, my emails tend to be sloppy and punctuation is optional because I, I answer a lot, uh, but I will try to get you an answer quickly. Okay. Thank you, Kevin, for having me, okay. inflicting your folks with me.